Hey, it's great to be with you this morning. My name is Colton. I am the director of student ministries here at PAC. And although I'm not actually old enough to remember this story, I've been told it enough that it does feel like uh, I can remember it. When I was just a little kid, uh, me and my cousin Jesse loved to play in our grandparents' basement. We'd play hockey. Sometimes we'd pretend that we were Jedi Knights taking on dark Sith Lords. And uh, we were playing there, and it was winter time, and so in my grandparents' basement at that time, there is a fireplace, a hot stove. And my grandparents say, Colton, Jesse, don't touch the hot stove. And then they left, and we played for a bit, and I'm a really curious person. And so I looked at the hot stove, and I thought, okay, well, I wonder what that's about. <laughs> And so I walked over to the hot stove, and I touched it really quickly, and nothing happened. I was fine. And so I, I went to Jesse, and I'm like, hey, man, I touched, the, I touched the hot stove, and nothing happened. So Jesse goes over to the hot stove, and he puts his finger on it and leaves it on there and burns his finger really badly. And, um, you know, there's some obvious pain involved after that. And so he, he told me that if you leave it on there, <laughs> it, it hurts. So what I decided to do was go back over to the stove and put my finger and hold it on there <laughs> until I burned my finger too. And then there was some screaming probably involved, I don't know. But I do think... My grandma told us that we were both kind of fighting to run the water over our fingers, these two young little idiots who just burnt themselves for not listening at all. And if I had only listened to grandma, I would have been fine. But disobedience can create pain. It can create hurt. It can create chaos. It can create things in us and around us that we don't actually want in our lives. We're starting a brand new series this morning. We just finished The Gentle Rhino, and now we're moving into the we ones, where we're taking, I almost get it wrong every time, so I've got to actually think about it. We're taking big looks at little books, big looks at little books, where over these next few weeks, we're going to be pulling apart some of the smaller books in their entirety throughout one week. And we're starting off with Jonah, which I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not that excited about because it's not the most exciting story. And I'll explain it to you like, like this. If you've seen the VeggieTales movie, there's uh, a song in VeggieTales that goes like this, and it basically summarizes Jonah in its entirety. Um, Jonah was a prophet, doodly do, but he never really got it, doodly do. You can clap if you want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Jonah was a prophet, and he never really did get it. You know, in the Bible, we have these different stories of prophets who seem to get things right, yet Jonah is this story where he gets the whole thing wrong. And Jonah is um, like when my mom used to uh, do things that she didn't want me to do. Like, I remember one time she swore at somebody while we were driving, and she just looked at me and she said, Colton, do as I say not as I do. <laughs> and uh, Jonah is one of those books. It's one of those things where uh, we learn what not to do. And Jonah isn't a great role model for us. The Most scholars believe and would just tell you, and you'll find out as soon as we dive into it in the first few verses, that this is a book about disobedience. And so when we look at other books in the Bible, there's sometimes other reasons why we might be experiencing pain or hurt or discomfort in our lives. But that's not the message of Jonah. Jonah is a message that says the pain and discomfort that you're experiencing in your life might be coming because of your choices and your disobedience. So you guys are in for a treat this morning. <laughs> so Jonah, we're going to take a look at that. I'm going to try to move through the whole story. We're going to skip parts of it just for time's sake, and I'll just summarize. But uh, as we move through this, let's See and take a look at disobedience. Because Jonah is a book about disobedience and direct disobedience at the start, I don't want to try to like 
trick you into thinking like, oh, uh, you secretly have disobedience. Jonah, right from the beginning, knew he wasn't supposed to be doing what he did. And so I just want you to ask yourself that question before we move forward. Is there something you're doing that you know you're not supposed to be doing? Or is there something that you know you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing? And we're going to take a look at how that goes for Jonah. (laughs) And (laughs) you might change your mind about being disobedient by the end of Jonah. (laughs) So why don't you pray with me? Let's ask God to both open our hearts and to speak to us through Jonah. And then uh, we'll dive into it. Oh yeah, last thing about Jonah. I'm trying to be a little bit silly here too because I believe and lots of scholars believe uh, the writers of Jonah are doing the same thing. It's such a serious topic and such a um, deep undertone of what the story of Jonah is actually communicating to us that they kind of write it in a playful way. So that's why um, before I studied Jonah for the sermon, I only remembered things like him being swallowed by a whale and stuff like that. But now that I read it, I realize that there is actually some serious implications that we can learn from the book of Jonah. So please pray with me, and then we will take a look at the story of Jonah. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, just reveal to us who you are, the good Father who loves us deeply. Jesus, I pray that you would uh, speak to us through the book of Jonah. I pray um, for grace and mercy. I pray that um, we would see you wanting to pull us into deeper things, a life of joy and peace. I pray that you would uh, illuminate in our lives where we are disobedient and then uh, give us the strength and the courage to move into freedom by moving back in line with who you are and what you're calling us to. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. You guys ready for the book of Jonah? Here we go. Jonah 1. One. Oh yeah, my subtitle is Jonah Runs from the Lord. Number one, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amidia. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. So Jonah is called to be a prophet, which means Jonah has been called to have high honor. It's a high honor position. Jonah would probably like to be a prophet. It also means he's probably pretty educated, and there's other reasons for us to believe that Jonah's pretty educated, and so not a bad thing to be called a prophet. But, verse 3, but Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. So, there we go. That's why this book is about disobedience, direct disobedience. He's doing exactly the opposite of what God is telling him to do. He's actually trying to get away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. So instead of going to Nineveh, Joan is going to go to Tarshish. Which is interesting that he wants to go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh because Nineveh is probably dirty roads with a group of people that Joan is not such a fan of. Yet, Tarshish, when we look at it in the Bible at other places, in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 22, it says that ships would come back, shiploads would come back from Tarshish with gold and silver and apes and ivory and peacocks, which I, ha- I don't understand at all why it says peacocks. I don't know why gold and peacocks are in the same sentence as good things. I'll take the gold, thank you very much, but I don't understand the peacocks. I- I'm probably, if we spent enough time trying to figure out why peacocks were valuable back then. I could give you something really cool and interesting, but I don't know. The point is, is that Tarshish was a lot more glamorous than Nineveh. And so God has this call on Jonah's life, and Jonah goes, "Um, no thanks, I'm going to do my own thing here, and I'm going to go after this. I have my own ideas of what my life is supposed to look like. And so, here's the thing about Jonah. Throughout the whole story, he's going to miss the fact that God is calling him into something really beautiful. 
He's calling him something that's really beautiful, and we're going to see it later. But he misses that. And because he can't see what God is doing, he misses out on this life where God is inviting him into great joy. But because it doesn't look how he wants it to look, he does his own thing. He goes to Tarshish. And Tarshish to us represents sin. It represents us trying to do things our own way, which is disobedience. It's me touching the fireplace. Tarshish is also a distorted view because we have to try to supplement what God is trying to give us for something else. And so here at PAC, we, uh, as a staff, we go through these NCD books where uh, we just uh, take these quizzes and evaluate who we are. And, and recently we just did one about um, what our most susceptible sin is and then the opposite energy of that. So God is calling you to do one thing and, the, and when we try to do it ourselves and, let, and we try to be God instead of be in relationship with God, then we end up doing something different. And so for me, mine is, uh, my positive thing is that God is calling me and something that he's gifted me to do is to simplify things, to create effective structures. And the counter sin is if I don't use what I have for God, the sin that I'm most susceptible to is gluttony. And so it means that I'm most likely when I sin to consume more than I need to. And not necessarily like, food-wise, but I consume more of my creative energy for me and myself instead of using it for others. And then there's some different ones too. So we're called to love people and to give ourselves for the sake of other people, but then when we don't do that and people don't get on board with our agenda, we get angry. And so anger is the opposite. So Tarsus is your agenda. And disobedience really is just saying, I know better than God. Because God's saying, Jonah, please go to Nineveh. Mm -mm, I'm going to go to Tarshish because that's what I imagine my life looking like. Not that. So I'm going to do my own thing. So John is going to do his own thing. Let's see how this goes. Hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. What's kind of interesting is he probably wants to go be a prophet in Tarshish. So he still wants to do God stuff just with his own agenda. (laughs) How many times do we do that? Where we try to pull God in and make him a part of our agenda instead of getting aboard on his agenda. And away from the presence of the Lord in Hebrew actually is away from the face of God. And so he doesn't actually want to see God's face because he knows that if he could see God's face, God wouldn't necessarily just be looking at him like, (laughs) he's not super happy. So, verse 4, But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Ever felt like you were caught in a storm? Ever felt like there was chaos around you? Ever felt like the world around you wasn't the way that it was supposed to? Ever felt like you were sinking? Ever felt like you were starting to drown? All this time, Jonah was asleep. Oh, fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Ever cried out to God in distress? There's this this rapper that I listen to sometimes, and he has this line that I find interesting. He says, um, I don't believe in God, but things got so messed up that I had to pray. Ever felt like you were drowning? Ever felt like there was nowhere else to turn but to pray? That's kind of the mode these sailors are in. There's chaos around them. There's a storm. They're caught in the middle of it. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you be asleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them that he was running away from the Lord. So why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what can we do to stop the storm? 
All right. So the storm is happening because of Jonah. So Jonah is about disobedience. After his disobedience follows a storm. When you find yourself in a storm, you need to ask yourself the question, am I in line with what God is calling me to right now? Or do I know that I am doing something that God's calling me not to do? Or am I not doing what I know God is calling me to do because the consequences of disobedience is that chaos begins to form around you. And now there's two things here that I want you to notice about Jonah's disobedience and what it does. The first is that our disobedience doesn't only affect you. Now you might know you're doing something wrong and you have to live with like the guilt or the shame of that, but it also affects the people around them. There's all of these sailors around him who are also caught in the storm. And for a little bit, Jonah doesn't even realize that there is a storm, which is also another interesting thing, is that you might not actually know that you're being disobedient. But here's a good sign. If everybody around you is telling you, hey, that thing in your life, it's a problem, it's probably a problem. If people look at you and they go, hey, dude, you're drinking, it's actually a problem and it's wrecking people's lives. You need to stop probably a problem. So they ask Jonah, what do we do? Because this storm is around us. It's creating havoc in our lives. What do we do? Jonah says, throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. Essentially eliminate me from the situation and everything will start to calm out because I'm the one who's creating this distress. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land that the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, O Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O Lord, you have sent us the storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. So, essentially, Jonah is creating havoc, and so they have to, even though they tried to help, even though they tried to row to safety, they just couldn't do it. He was still living in disobedience. They had to actually remove him and throw him into the sea. And now he's in the sea, (laughs) and I love this. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah gets thrown over, and I think that This is really just a clever way of God sending Jonah to his room for a little bit. (laughs) Jonah's not eating with the rest of the family very well. He's not eating his peas, and he's got a bad attitude about it. So he has to go to his room for a little bit before his attitude is better, and he can be a happy person with all the other happy people. (laughs) This is what we just call confinement in the Bible. There's different ways of it. It's usually expressed through the idea of being in the desert. We'll see that later on Jonah ends up in confinement again and he's outside of community. But this is really just the author's way of trying to say that it's, his disobedience is creating so much havoc that God has put him in confinement and now he's stuck in the belly of a whale. And it's hard to go anywhere when you're in the middle of the ocean in the middle, like not only are you stuck in the middle of the ocean, you're also in the belly of a whale. The, the writer here is just really trying to say, Jonah's really stuck. He's really confined. And he's sent him to his room, and until he has a good attitude, we're going to leave him in there. Which is what any good parent does to their kid that's being disobedient. I got sent to my room all the time. <laughs> I, I was in my room a lot. You know where else I was quite a few times was the principal's office, which is the same idea. (laughs) I got sent there, too. Yep. Anyways, you know, though, it was harder in my home. My mom was really hard. (laughs) Um, But I'm actually really thankful for what she did for me now, looking back. When uh, we were kids, we had a chore chart on the fridge, and every... Um, day after school, you had to come home and do a chore. And Thursdays was floor day, and I hated doing the floors. 
because my mom not only made us do stuff, she thought she would make it more difficult for us to teach us discipline. So we couldn't use a mop. We had to get on our hands and wash the floor. And she had this rule called corner to corner. And so she would afterwards go from corner of the house to the corner of the house to make sure you did it properly. And if you didn't do it properly, you have to do it again. You didn't get corner to corner. Also, we owned a dishwasher, but we weren't allowed to use it. <laughs> now, you also weren't just allowed to do things. You had to do it with a good attitude. And if you couldn't do it with a good attitude, you got sent, guess where? To confinement, to your room. And you had to sit there until you could do your chores with a good attitude. So there was a lot of nights I sat in my room for a long time. But I'm so thankful for that now because what it taught me was how to adjust your heart, which is what Jonah does in chapter 2. We're not going to read the entirety of chapter 2, but all of chapter 2 is Jonah praying. He's stuck in the whale, and he decides to pray. He decides to reflect. The, what he's doing is a deep meditation. And um, what's really interesting about chapter 2 is that Jonah is educated in the Psalms. We know that because every single line of chapter 2 is not an original thing. He just took different parts of the different Psalms and put them together and prayed kind of like a, a prayer that would be more like in our time, like, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let this food to us be blessed. But he just took some of those and, and mixed them together to pray. So he's, he's creating a prayer out of what he already knows. And in the Bible, there's the book of Psalms, which is all of these different prayers, and a lot of them are called lamentations, which means they're like uh, prayers of distress. So I'm not doing good right now. God, why are you doing this to me? Please save me from this. And then there's another type, which are thanksgiving prayers, which are prayers of like uh, gratitude, like thanks for saving me. You are my healer. You are my savior. You are my rock. You are my fortress. Jonah's situation, um, by all means, he's stuck in the middle of the ocean. He's put in his bedroom for a little bit. <laughs> um, he uh, doesn't pray a lamentation. He prays a prayer of thanksgiving, which I think for you is the key and for me is the key for when we get put in our room. And that's what I learned as a kid getting stuck in my room. Sitting there and being angry I sat there for hours. It didn't help. <laughs> it wasn't until I actually began to think different, until I actually started to go, okay, I'm going to be happy. Okay, I'm going to be happy. Okay, I'm going to be happy. Until you actually got to a place where you could be happy. And this is what Jonah is doing. He's saying things like, oh, I've come so far away from the presence of the Lord, but I will get back into my call. I will find His presence again. I will move into a place where I am in line with God. And he just says that over and over again. And that's what all of chapter 2 is until the last verse is uh, he's in his room. He starts to pray those things. And then the, the last verse is, and so then God made the whale spit Jonah out onto the sea. <laughs> so now Jonah's lying on the beach with a new heart, new attitude. He's ready to go to Nineveh. <laughs> he's ready to fulfill the call on his life. He was in his bedroom for a little while and now he's ready to come on out. And so we're going to pick up the story in chapter 3, which is actually interesting because this is where Jonah begins to be obedient. But remember, Jonah was a prophet, doodly doo, but he never really got it, doodly doo. Um, even in his obedience, though, he missed out. And so I just want to talk a little bit, and we're going to look at how Jonah, even was doing the right thing, still missed out on what God was doing. And what, well, let's just read a little bit of chapter 3 here. Okay, chapter 3, verse 1. Remember, he's lying on the beach. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Um, some translations 
say, uh, overthrown. In 40 days, uh, Nineveh will be overthrown. And uh, this is the first sign that we see Jonah misses it. Because when we fast forward in the story, Jonah gets mad that he got it wrong. What's interesting, though, is that Jonah actually got it right. The word that he gave was right. Now, every Jewish person that's reading the story knows that Jonah got it right, but believed the wrong thing about the right thing. <laughs> he came in with his own agenda. And he said, okay, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Every Jewish person that reads this story goes, oh, God was actually giving a lot of hope to Nineveh. Because there's nowhere else in the Bible where after 40 days, something bad happens. So this is just a clever trick by the author to say, oh, from the whole time, there was this plan to redeem Nineveh. Even in the word for them, he said, after 40 days, you will be overthrown. And it's not in the sense of like God's going to come and destroy them. It's actually a prophetic word that God is going to come and redeem it in, in that time. But Jonah is so into his own agenda of things that he gives them an improper eschatology. And we could go into that for a long time, but he basically gives them the doom and gloom message like, turn or burn! <laughs> and uh, he got so caught up in his own agenda, and what we're going to see later is because it was still because he wanted Tarshish. He still wanted to go to Tarshish in his heart, and so he thought, maybe if I can just be obedient, and I, you know, check that off the list, and then I can have this other thing. But in so, he misses doing it. Because Jonah believed God was going to destroy Nineveh, and when he said it, that's what he thought God was going to do. He thought God's going to destroy this city. But that's not what God did. Jonah gives the message, 40 days from now and you will be overthrown. And guess what God does? What he always does. Grace, mercy, reconciliation, healing, and the violence stopped. The violence stopped. And now we know that this is the heart of the Father because one of the things that God hates more than anything is when we benefit at the cost of somebody else, when we hurt somebody else. And so there's violence happening and God goes, oh man, my children are hurting each other. I'm going to send somebody in there to heal them. And like my grandma telling me, don't touch the stove. It's not because she wanted like, to control me. She's trying to protect me. And so God is asking these people to repent, not because he wants to hurt them or control them or manipulate them, because the heart of the Father is good and he has something good for the people of Nineveh. And what Jonah's not seeing is he gets to be a part of this thing in its entirety. He is the message piece for it all. But he misses it because he gets not so happy. Now, this chapter 4 is a dialogue between God and Jonah, and it's almost hilarious, <laughs> the different tones that they're taking. So let's read chapter 4, and we'll go through that part, because God has just healed Nineveh. He's redeeming it. He's bringing reconciliation to the city. And look at Jonah, even though he's obedient. The change of plans greatly upset Jonah. Okay, so there's healing, there's reconciliation happening. Jonah's mad. And he became very angry, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say I left home that you, before I left home that you would do this, Lord? <laughs> Didn't I say that you would do this? Didn't I say you would bring healing and reconciliation? Haven't I believed my whole life that you're a God of grace and mercy? Haven't I said that all of this time? That's why I ran away to Tarshish, though. <laughs> because Listen, listen to this. I knew I ran away from Tarshish because I knew that you are merciful and a compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love, and you are eager to turn back from destroying people. Okay, wait. <laughs> Jonah, you're mad that God's healing, bringing reconciliation, doing grace, bringing mercy to people? Yeah. Why? Well, we'll find out. Just kill me, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Who's Jonah concerned with? 
Disobedience comes out of a place and a spirit of self. I want what I want. And if I don't get it, I'll try to get it a different way. And so he has his own plan in this, in its entirety. And yet God is doing something amazing and he can't see it because what he wanted isn't happening. And so his expectations aren't being met. And so he gets upset with God and he disobeys. And then even when he does obey, he misses out in partaking on the beautiful thing that is happening because now he has to face the hard reality of going back to Nineveh and living in Nineveh knowing that God didn't do what he thought he was going to do. He's going to have to admit that he was wrong, and admitting that he was wrong is going to be really hard. And so what does Jonah do? He goes back into confinement because Jonah doesn't want to say he's wrong, and he's angry because even though God is doing this good thing, he's angry that God didn't do his thing. And so often the chaos and the havoc that happens in our life is because we're upset that God isn't doing our thing and we miss out on what God is doing. And so much of our discontentment with God comes from that reason in itself is that I become so consumed with God's not doing that I miss out on what he is doing. So here's the question that you need to ask yourself. If you feel like you're missing God right now in your life, stop asking what he's not doing and start asking what is he doing? What is he doing all around me? And then get on board because it's going to be good. And that's what we know about the good father is it's going to be good. Because this is even what we see in Jonah, that it's always good. So Jonah goes out to the desert, or the east side of the city, made a shelter to sit under, and he waited to see what would happen. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. So, he's mad, so he goes and sits and then God grows a plant over him, and he's happy. But then God arranged for a worm. The next morning, at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And the sun grew hot. God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yep, Jonah reported, <laughs> even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there? It came quickly and died quickly, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for great city? The end. (laughs) Interesting, hey? The end. So I think we see some two pretty different perspectives here on what's going on. God is going, Jonah, you're upset because you have such a small view of what I'm doing right now. And here's what you will find too, and it's what I will find as we continue to pursue after Jesus Christ together. And that is that we will consistently, when we obey with him, find ourselves in a story that was more amazing, more beautiful, where God was doing more grace and mercy than we could have ever imagined. And when we're upset with him, it's because our perspective is just too small. Jonah's worried about a little leaf, and God's like, dude, open your eyes. We just saved an entire city, and I did it through you. (laughs) That's awesome. You're missing out on what I'm doing because you're still upset that you don't have it your way. And when we don't have it our way, then we try and blah, circle, 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 circle. So, disobedience, Jonah creates havoc, storm. Here's what I love about Jonah is actually the way that it ends because it ends with a choice. Now, Jonah is the messenger to Nineveh, right? But it ends with the one he was supposed to give the message to. They become the messenger to Jonah. And so now Nineveh is the message to Jonah. He's sitting there in the desert and he has different choices that he gets to make. He can choose to live in his own agenda in his own disobedience if he wants and it leads to anger, frustration, discontentment or 
He has the choice to do the hard thing, admit that he was wrong, go back into Nineveh and find himself caught, wrapped up in a story that was way bigger and full of grace than he ever could have imagined and find a God that loves him more and wanted to bring him more goodness than he could have thought. But he still has the choice. What is he going to do? And here's the thing, is that um, havoc or chaos in our lives is actually like in the beginning. In Genesis 1, it says in the beginning, there was tohu wabohu, there was chaos, there was an order, and then God spoke and made order out of the chaos. But it's creative, and creation includes forming and molding and shaping, and that doesn't always feel great. Obedience sometimes is difficult. It's going to be hard for Jonah to go back into the city and admit that he got the word wrong. It's going to be hard for him to do that, but it's the necessary step for him moving back into freedom, peace, love, and joy. And I've never had my, dis- or my shoulder dislocated but I've heard from people that have dislocated their shoulder that it's kind of like that. When you dislocate your shoulder, you're in terrible pain and agony, and it's always kind of there, like, goes out. But then I've heard the worst pain is when it actually goes back in, and when they put it back in. That's the most painful part. But as soon as they put it back in, there's instant relief. And I kind of think that that's what moving into obedience can sometimes feel like. It's a quick hurt with instant relief. A little bit of humility, but instant relief. And so, the havoc in your life may or may not be from disobedience. But you know. (laughs) You know if it is or not. You know. So we're going to sing a song called Mercy, and I want you to remember that this is who God is. Then I'm going to come back up And uh, we'll close and pray together. Yeah, that's what we believe, by the way. (laughs) That there's always mercy and you're not ever walking into anything else. And as a church community, we are convinced of that because of Jesus Christ. So we don't even need to be afraid of our own sin because all we should believe is that we'll only ever be met by grace and mercy. There is nothing else waiting for you on the other side. So the question then is, do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him that He knows what's best for you? Do you trust Him with the call and the plan on your life? Or are you going to try to do things your own way? The choice is yours. And if you find yourself in disobedience, then you might need to walk back into Nineveh and I promise you, you will be met with nothing but being caught up in a bigger love story than you could have ever imagined, full of mercy. So I'm going to call the prayer team forward. Today you might need to call somebody. You might need to sign up for a house church. I'm not sure. You might need to do something. Um, Yeah. Otherwise, may you have the strength to admit when you're wrong. May you have the courage to have humility and walk back into Nineveh. May you always know that when you come back in line with God, all you will be met with is open arms like the good father and the prodigal son, he runs out to meet you. So may you, if you are living in disobedience, have an experience of the Father with his arms open wide, running out to meet you. Have a blessed week, guys. Thanks.